Well, good evening, everyone. Thank you for being here this evening. It is very encouraging uh, to see you here this evening. And uh, it's always encouraging when uh, anyone would come together and have an interest to study God's Word. So I'm very thankful for your presence. Uh, we will be uh, studying uh, Proverbs. Uh, you can see uh, on the slide, we'll begin in chapter 10. And we will go through this chapter 10, but we're looking at the collection of Solomon's Proverbs that, that's covered in chapters 10 through 22, ending on verse 16. We want to also welcome those that are on live stream. If you're visiting on live stream, we are we're very thankful that you have, have lo logged in. We are thankful for you being there. And uh, if you're part of the congregation here, not able to attend, but on live stream, we welcome you and we miss you and hope that you will be back with us again very soon. Before we get started, Brother Seth has agreed to direct our minds in prayer to help focus our minds and, and get us ready for our study. Go ahead, Seth. Thank you. Thank you, Seth. <clears throat> we appreciate that, that prayer. Our lesson plan for this evening, just so you'll know kind of the, the direction of where we will be going, as you can see there on the slide, we'll start with just a very brief introduction just to help our minds to focus on, on some background. And then we'd like to take some time to read chapter 10. It's actually just slightly over a three minute uh, read. So there's 32 verses there, but it's three minutes that would be time very well spent. As we read through chapter 10, notice and just kind of uh, listen to the re reading, follow along, of course. Listen to, and with a, a note to pay attention to the vocabulary words that are used and the messages that are, are there and contained. Then we'll look at some questions and have some discussion. Um, after we read chapter 10, and you'll see the questions there, and then we'll have, uh, should have plenty of time for a summary, so we're, we'll go ahead and get started um, with, with, with that. And we know that previously, you know, we have studied in the classes in these series, lo looking at, at these, these texts, and primarily the book of Proverbs, we remember uh, the re reading, it's in 1 Kings chapter 3, uh, verses 6 through 15, and Second Chronicles chapter 1, verses 1 through 12. Both of those texts describe a critical moment in the life of Solomon. It was a time when he was roughly about 18 to 20 years old. Uh, Brother Ed went through this briefly on July 10th class. It's very important to come back to that and focus on what is going on in Solomon's life. It does pertain to uh, the purpose and the need for the Proverbs that we are going to read about. Uh, it was a time around 967 or 969 BC. I'm not going to have any ar arguments or discussions in this class about the exact spot and time on the timeline, but just generally put your mind in that place in the Old Testament um, on the timeline. That's a very important time. Uh, the place was Gibeon. It was a high place. It was one of the higher places where uh, the altar, one of the altars for the Lord, where they offered sacrifice, was set up. 
Solomon offered a thousand burnt offerings that day. And as we recall, uh, that night, God appeared unto him in a dream, or at least a voice. But when we read the text, there is a very important question that God asked Solomon. He says, ask what I shall give you. Could you imagine that? Could you, well, let's not get into dreams too much, but could you imagine being asked by God, ask, and ask what I shall give you. Uh, Solomon was very astute, and he asked, we know, we've reviewed this, we've read it many times, let's come back to this fact on what he asked for. He asked for wisdom, understanding. Specifically, I'm going to read uh, verse 9. This is in 1 Kings chapter 3, and in verse 9, Give your servant, therefore, an understanding mind to govern your people, that I may discern between good and evil. For who is able to govern this, your great people? The record in Second Chronicles said that the, the number of people in Solomon's mind, they were more numerous than the dust of the earth. So in Solomon's mind, this is a vast, great number of people. I'm 18, 20 years old. Uh, who wouldn't feel like a child? Uh, anyone that doesn't feel like a child, I think that would make it very difficult to discern and to understand. So as we review this background, you can begin to see where I'm going with this, where the text goes with this. There's going to be a tremendous amount of application in our lives that we will see tonight as we go through some of these Proverbs. Um, so that's the, the time. It's mentioned three times the word discern comes up in verses 9, 11, and 12. Um, this request to be able to discern. Uh, so we know that this purpose, this need that Solomon first recognized, he knew what to ask for, which is noteworthy in and of itself. He's king. Why would it be important to be able to discern it's revealed, one of the Proverbs in chapter 16, verse 12, it reads, to be, in verse 12, in order to perform this, he, he needs this ability to, to discern. And the proverb reads, it is an abomination to kings to do evil, for the throne is established by righteousness. So it's going to be critical for Solomon if the kingdom of God in his hands, while he is on the throne, at 20 years old, for it to be a success, he must be able to tell the difference between good and evil. Very important. We know that it's recorded also. He, I just think this is fascinating. He recorded over 1,000 proverbs and 1,005 songs. Why 1,005? Why, why did he stop at 1,005? I just find that fascinating. Uh, but 1,005 songs. Uh, so let's go ahead and, is everyone okay with that before we start the re reading tonight? Any questions about the background before we proceed? Okay, if not, uh, here's the questions that we will be discussing tonight. Just kind of peruse those briefly, and then I'll begin our reading here. <clears throat> uh, Proverbs chapter 10. We'll be reading, I will be reading beginning in verse 1 to the end of verse 31. <clears throat> the Proverbs of Solomon. A wise son makes a glad father, but a foolish son is a sorrow to his mother. Treasures gained by wickedness do not profit, but righteousness delivers from death. The Lord does not let the righteous go hungry, but he thwarts the craving of the wicked. A slack hand causes poverty, but the hand of the diligent makes rich. He who gathers in summer is a prudent son, but he who sleeps in harvest is a son who brings shame. Blessings are on the head of the righteous, but the mouth of the wicked conceals violence. The memory of the righteous is a blessing, but the name of the wicked will rot. The wise of heart will receive commandments, but a babbling fool will come to ruin. Whoever walks in integrity walks securely, but he who makes his ways crooked will be found out. 
Whoever winks the eye causes trouble, and a babbling fool will come to ruin. The mouth of the righteous is a fountain of life, but the mouth of the wicked conceals violence. Hatred stirs up strife, but love covers all offenses. On the lips of him who has understanding, wisdom is found, but a rod is for the back of him who lacks sense. The wise lay up knowledge, but the mouth of a fool brings ruin near. The rich man's wealth is his strong city. The poverty of the poor is their ruin. The wage of the righteous leads to life, the gain of the wicked to sin. Whoever heeds instruction is on the path to life, but he who rejects reproof leads others astray. The one who conceals hatred has lying lips, and whoever utters slander is a fool. When words are many, transgression is not lacking, but whoever restrains his lips is prudent. The tongue of the righteous is choice silver. The heart of the wicked is of little worth. The lips of the righteous feed many, but fools die for lack of sense. The blessing of the Lord makes rich, and he adds no sorrow with it. Doing wrong is like a joke to a fool, but wisdom is pleasure to a man of understanding. What the wicked dregs Dreads will come upon him, but the desire of the righteous will be granted. When the tempest passes, the wicked is no more, but the righteous is established forever. Like vinegar to the teeth and smoke to the eyes, so is the slugger to those who send him. The fear of the Lord prolongs life, but the years of the wicked will be short. The hope of the righteous brings joy, but the expectation of the wicked will perish. The way of the Lord is a stronghold to the blameless, but destruction to evildoers. The righteous will never be removed, but the wicked will not dwell in the land. The mouth of the righteous brings forth wisdom, but the perverse tongue will be cut off. The lips of the righteous know what is acceptable, but the mouth of the wicked what is perverse. That's Proverbs chapter 10, verses 1 through 31. I'm sorry, 32. So in look, looking at that uh, chapter and in, in the questions here, uh, you had time to think while you listened to the reading and followed along. Um, are there any words that, that seem to be repeated, words that seem to be in this text on a more frequent occurrence? Brother Grant. Yeah. Good, yeah. The, between the righteous and the wicked and the wise and the foolish is the answer. And a key phrase that our brother used is contrast and comparison. That leads to the next question, so we can work on both questions at once. Who's tired of multitasking? There we go. There's two questions. We're going to put them together. But com contrast and comparison. Uh, we had colon and bicolon. We have parallelisms. We can see that. And we can see the flow when we see a contrast and a comparison. Um, wh what about that? A a answer, what about contrast and comparison? And what about frequency of the, of the vocabulary words used? Did you find anything different? Does contrast and comparison, is there any value to that for you? Two questions, you can pick one. Brother David, yeah. Um, I'll answer a couple of different ones. So, the other, the other words that are repeated, which go to your second question, uh, are life and death, right? And those are the result of the other words that are repeated, which is what is And so, from a compare and contrasting point of view, it's constantly drilling into us that uh, the result of the righteous is life. 
Thank you for bringing that, that, that out. So what our brother has explained, that there is a, a, an important contrast between life and death. Just to su summarize, if I may. There's a contrast between life and death. That's a very important point. We want to underscore that one. You might want to write it down or type it in your phone, put it in notes, uh, because that is something of value, right? This is life and death. We're not talking about merely Oh, it'll be, my life will be more convenient, which it, it will with life and with the knowledge that's in Proverbs. Uh, but when we consider, I, I may end up with something very, very severe, like death, if not myself, those around me or my family. Uh, so very important knowledge that we want to pay attention to. It definitely goes in the value bank somewhere in our notes that we want to really uh, underscore that, that point. Uh, the contrast and comparison, our brother used the word define, and, and we want to develop that more. Uh, that's a very important point. Is that Aaron? Aaron, yeah, you're, you're in the hinterland there, so I see you, I see you, okay. Speak, yeah. Thank you. Yeah. There is a choice. Yes. Right. Right. So our sister has identified a very key word, a, the conjunction uh, but. If this, but that, that tells us that there's a choice to be made. Even if we're not thinking about making a choice, a particular action is a choice. A particular inaction could be a choice. If not this, but that. See, there's power in comparison and contrasting. There's power in that. It, it defines, it reveals to us that there's a choice to be made. There's choices that we know. There's choices to be made in, in, in life, uh, which raises that there must be careful pl planning. So there's just a lot of things that follow from that. Uh, moving along here, Everyone's okay with that. Um, mo moving along here, are there any Proverbs in, ch in chapter 10? Uh, we, we could look at, towards the end, we'll look at a more expansive, we'll look at the landscape more and go to chapter 22. But just for now, in chapter 10, are there any Proverbs or a proverb or more uh, that stand out to you? One that is just like music, it just sticks in your brain or, or you have found... A, a very pertinent application for it in your life? Uh, Nola? Yes. Go ahead. Yeah. How's that for a word picture? So our sister read, she's citing verse 26, like vinegar to the teeth and smoke to the eyes, so is a sluggard those who sent him. Have you found application for that passage in your life? <laughs> hopefully, hopefully not, right? <laughs> but we, we're on the receiving end. I worked very closely in my, my um, work with another individual, and we would divvy up tasks. We would plan, and he would say, Terry, you do this, and I'll say, okay, you're gonna do that, and he'd say, yes, I'll, I'll do that. So we always knew what the left and the right hand was doing, we always knew. One day he walked in my office and he said, Terry, did you do that? And he was referring to what we agreed on that each one of us would do. And he said, Terry, did you do that? And I said, so-and-so, have I ever not done for you what I said I would do for you? Because I had this first in my mind. I do not want to be vinegar in his teeth or smoke to his eyes. Not once, not ever. <laughs> so these Proverbs are, are very helpful that we, there's a lot of application here. Thank you for bringing that, that, 
that, that, that one out. Any others that, that stand, stand out? <coughs> yes. Wes. These are, are recurrent themes. Um, I think you said in verses, um, v- verse 12, and what was the other verse that you cited? 16. The wage of the righteous leads to life, the gain of the wicked to sin. So a, a very clear, you know, we know the pro- pro- Proverbs are poems and parables and maxims. Uh, this one almost could be a maxim. It's repeated enough times, and as our brother Wes has pointed out, it's repeated. The, the concept and the fact is repeated in the New, New Testament. Um, so to, to go, go on here, we want to look at also, you know, we, we spent some time Sunday at, at our last class on lo- looking at the parallel um, verses, how, how they, there's colons and bicolons, and there, there's verses that run parallel, and the verse that follows one will expand on the verse before, and we start to get word pictures that develop, and then they're repeated. We've discussed some, some, some of that. Actually, we've repeated that because it needs repeating. Uh, it helps us uh, to remember it, uh, and then we start to get this, this flow. So we see that there's, there's a parallel between verses um, look, if you would, at verses 6 through 11. Verse 6 is, Blessings are on the head of the righteous, but the mouth of the wicked conceals violence. And then it goes down in verse 11. This phrase is repeated again. The mouth of the righteous is a fountain of life, but the mouth of the wicked conceals violence. There seems, some may call this a bookend, but I think there's more going on here in light of the classes, as our brother Ed has been teaching us, we, we, we can see that there's parallelism going on. And, and there's verses that follow that, that develop word pictures beyond what, is, what the preceding verses say. So we see in verses 6 and 11, the, these are couch, these these two verses here, there's a commonality that the mouth of the wicked conceals violence. Uh, this, this phrase, con- conceals violence, um, is, is that it? <clears throat> conceals violence in the Hebrew means the violence covers. That's what this phrase means. You, you may have a footnote in your Bible. Uh, conceals violence. Um, this violence covers. So we want to think of that. that that's important to look, look, look at that. And then there's this phrase in verses 8 and 10. The wise of heart will receive commandments, but a babbling fool will come to ruin. Look at the phrase, a babbling fool. It's repeated again in verse 10. So this concept of a babbling fool, babbling here means brimming, like full. A babbling, you know, in our common vernacular in English, babbling, I mean, I get the idea that, hopefully I don't babble or ramble, but babble seems it would be in the rambling category, or just kind of babbling on and not making any sense. And actually, that's not what the word means. It means brimming. It's full. It's full at the banks. Like picture a river that is just swollen at the banks. It's, we haven't had a lot of rain, but we've seen rivers that are swollen before, surely. Uh, that's what this word is, means, babbling, brimming. That, and then plug that into the verse here. 
a babbling fool will come to ruin. A fool that is, that is just full of foolishness, brimming with foolishness, is going to have the consequences. There will be a choice, a choice to measure words uh, or to just babble on, brim with foolishness, that's going to lead somewhere. It, it's not neutral. It's not like there's no net negative, no loss. There will be loss, is what that is saying. Um, when we plug all of that in together, um, and we get to verse 11, let's read verse 11, follow along with me if you would, and let's just extract verse 11 and listen to it as it stands alone and, and not pay any attention between verses 6 through 10. So verse 11, the mouth of the righteous is a fountain of life, but the mouth of the wicked conceals violence. I should add that the uh, concealing violence means the violence covers. I think we pointed that out already. So that the, the mouth of the wicked conceals violence. It covers violence. That's where that, that footnote we have in our text. Your, your Bible probably ha ha has that. So for it to stand alone, the mouth of the righteous is a fountain of, of life. So that out of their mouth, we could infer, because out of the mouth of the w w wicked is covered with violence. But compare that with the mouth of the right righteous. It's a fountain of life. That has a lot of meaning just standing on its own. But when we look at the full context, all of these parallelisms that, is go that are going, that are revealed here, and consider it as a parallel now with verse 8. Look at 8 and 10. Bear with me here. This is an, an exercise based on the tremendous effort of teaching that our brother has done who preceded me in, in the cl cl classes. He's pointed these things out and has shown us how these texts are stru structured so that we can get more out of it. So let's plug it in to verse 6. The blessings on the head of the righteous. So blessings on the head of the right, right, righteous, it covers them. But what, what covers the wicked? Violence. What covers them? So it's not like they're, they do hide wickedness. If they're, they might have wickedness in their heart and they don't they lie, a person lies, and they don't reveal what's truly in their heart. That's a lie. We could infer that, I think, reasonably in verse 6. But when we look at those definitions and we look at both of those verses to get together, we can see that blessings are on the head of the righteous, but the mouth of the fool is covered with violence. And then in verse 11, it's more than just blessings on their head. Their mouth, it's a fountain of life. And brimming, a babbling fool is brimming. So it's this red river just brimming at, at, at the bank or, or at both banks. So there's, I just wanted to point out and go through that exercise because as we read through these and we look at the par parallels, there's also parallel within a parallel. That's what I believe verses 6 through 11 represents. And to me, the reason I think it's worthwhile to spend time on going through this exercise in addition to what I've just said. It's a signature of the Holy Spirit, the wisdom of God. The wisdom of God that the, through the Holy Spirit, God said he would give it to Solomon, that none before you would have more wisdom than you, Solomon, and none coming after you. For Solomon to write this, it's all layered together. It's more than just parallelism. It's te like a tapestry. It's, it's a fabric. It's layer upon layer of wisdom that is all tied together. And we can extract it and use one verse, have it stand on its own, or we can consider it all together. So I think that's very important. Um, so the word righteous, it occurs in the book of Proverbs 86 times, if you're interested. But since, we're, since I asked the question, what words stand out? And the question was correctly answered, I believe. I, I, I would say. It occurs 86 times in the book of Proverbs. 
the word, as it's used in Pro- Proverbs and in most of the places in the Old Testament, means just and lawful. Very important for a kingdom to be established by righteousness that the decisions are right, righteous. Uh, in the preceding classes, we uh, it was brought out that the king has a tremendous job of making a right judgment. We read, if we keep reading in chapter 3, how does that chapter end? Remember the two women with the baby and one mother was childless because the baby died and how Solomon solved that? How in the world would a 20-year-old know how to identify a mother who is lying? Remember that. We've heard that story many times. Give me a, give, give me a nod or not, right? You're still with me, right? We know that story. Mothers know their nurturing instinct. How would a 20-year-old young man as king know that just by just looking at the reaction of bring me a sword, divide that child in two, all he has to do is watch for the reaction on that woman's face. Is there any mother that knows when their child is not ill, not sick? If you want to know anything about the child, just ask mom. The mother knows. And I was well beyond 20 before I ever figured that out. A lot of people have to be taught that. But Solomon somehow knew. How did he know? We know how he knew. That's a tremendous amount of of, um, wisdom and an example of Solomon discerning. Find that fascinating. uh, The term wicked or raw is used 12 times in chapter 10. It's used 82 times in the book of Proverbs and 32 times just in the section 10 through 13. So you heard our brother mention contrast and comparison. It's not enough to know what is right, because how will we know if we're not taught? And that's what Proverbs does, is it helps us to discern. This is what evil looks like. This is what righteousness looks like. It helps us to be able to discern. Put, what did David do? Define it. Any further proverbs that stand out to you? Because I've, I've said enough to allow you to think and absorb, consider what I say, but also to think what stands out to you. We're doing okay on time. Brother, yes. Our brother likes, Brother John likes verse 19. Uh, For those on live stream, when words are many, transgression is not lacking, but whoever restrains his lips is prudent. Would you mind sharing why, why it strikes a chord with you? I like this one, too. <clears throat> Sometimes we know when to be really quiet, hopefully, right? <laughs> but then there's the times, like, you know, words fitly spoken is like a jewel. Too. Uh, there's a lot of proverbs like that about speech. That's one of the themes that we'll cover in our, that we'll come back to in our summary. Yes, Brother Wally. Thanks, John. Yeah. Okay.
think the moral of your point that you're br bringing out there was the example of two people, two individuals at a turnstile that refused to pay the toll or pay, pay the fee. Uh, and it, based on your report, I'm not aware of that news um, piece, but based on your report, uh, it is that they chose violence instead, allegedly chose violence and not pay the fee. To that point, um, those type of incidents happen very quickly, can happen very fast. Um, so that we have these proverbs, this study, Ed brings out or has brought out this, the, the deep brain part. It's what is, we review these pro proverbs and read them. Remember what was po pointed out, one proverb a day, you'll get through the whole book of Proverbs in a month, except for the month of Fe February, where you just read a little bit more, you'll still get through the whole book. In a year, you'll get through this book of Proverbs 12 times. So this information is going to start to come out. One of the points in the summary, which we're not on yet, but it's timely now, is that our thoughts lead to our words, leads to our actions. So our, if our thinking, our Proverbs, and to what Wes's point, the teachings as, as a learner and a follower of Jesus Christ, we, we won't fall in, to use, to borrow your term, trap. We will not follow or fall into that trap. And there's a lot of other analogies, a lot of other traps to fall in. Um, Proverbs 6 comes to mind. We don't want to fall into the trap that's discussed there. I could go on, but there was a, I think there was a hand on this side. Go ahead, Aaron. That's the ESV translation, yes. Mm -hmm. Yes. Yes. Yes, and to Wally's point, I, I believe you said there were two. So was one kind of leading that? You know, and maybe the other one was more docile and and, and just kind of followed the other one. So we, we just we don't want to lead others astray for sure. Uh, you know, death and life, um, defining what right and wrong is, what righteous and wickedness is. Sometimes, a lot of times, because we've already decided what we are going to do if we find ourselves in a particular situation, that it's reflex when we are in that situation that when stressed, when pressed, when assaulted, we don't raise a hand. When yelled at, like, yeah, I have nothing, nothing to say. What I'm thinking is, I can't hear you because you're yelling at me, but what I say is not anything. <laughs> it's best, best to keep quiet sometimes, measure the word. Okay, let's move along here now. Um, so for some application, more application, thank you for bringing all of those things out. I'm sorry, if I've missed anyone on the periphery here, I'm sorry, I, I haven't done a lot of this tonight. Okay, I didn't miss anyone. Uh, good. Uh, turn, if you would, to James chapter 3, uh, verses 14 through 17. Um, in the last, we just have five mi minutes here. Uh, what I wanted to look at here is just, we, we get the context here, beginning in verse 14. It really comes to a head in verse 17. Uh, James chapter 3, verse 17, but the wisdom from above is first pure, then peaceable, gentle, open to reason, full of mercy and good fruits, impartial and sincere. We have pure, peaceable, gentle, reasonable, full of mercy and good fruits, impartial, sincere, which also means genuine. So we have seven attributes of wisdom in the New Testament for us to internalize. I'm sure we've already have done that, but as we teach others, as we're an example so we don't lead others astray as we're teaching our children 
There's seven attributes here that the Holy Spirit has given us. I think of seven pillars of wisdom. These could be the seven pillars of attributes of the New Testament. Because if we internalize these things, when we're in that moment, find ourselves in a spot, don't have time to think, it's, it's okay. Because we've already thought it through. If there's not peace, we'll be peace. If there's someone not being gentle, we'll be gentle. If there's someone speaking vile, and I'll, I'll be pure, aren't I? Not laughing at that. So we have to practice these things. I'm not saying it's easy. I'm not saying I have been 100% successful. Like how many times do I have to fail before I can finally get it? That's kind of how it is. It's the Hebrews 5 verse 14 that we, where it says, solid food is for the mature, for those who have their powers of discernment trained by constant practice to distinguish good from evil. So we have to practice distinguishing and discerning the, these things. The last question is, in the last couple of minutes that we have, what is the example we can learn from Solomon? What would be your take-home point? Um, and forget about, don't talk about his, we're not talking about his wives and the concubines and that part. The Holy Spirit gave Solomon a lot, and, and he, he went to a lot of work. A thousand Proverbs, 1,005 songs, and there's a lot of examples. Do you have a take-home point, a take-home, something of value that you learned from Solomon? If not tonight, you've, you've learned it previously, and you're willing to share it with the rest of the class. Brother West. universally applicable and no exp expiration date is to underscore the point that our bro brother made. We're out of time here now. We have in the last 30, 36 seconds here. I have to do this because I'm filling in for Brother Ed. So the other chapters, the rest of up to verse 20, chapter 22, verse 16, the other themes, we want to continue the exercise as we did tonight Look for the parallelisms, the contrast, and the comparison. There's four themes, major themes, that stand out. There's the diligent, the diligent versus the slothful, the slough sluggard. So we want to notice the word diligent. That's a category that Solomon has chosen. The use of speech, which we have touched on tonight, but it's further developed in the rest of the chapters. And sense, having good sense, um, lack of sense having good sense. There's contrast and comparison. No exp expiration date. Um, our thoughts and our words and actions, they lead to wealth or poverty. There will be a consequence on our thoughts, words, and actions. Someone said choice. We have a choice. The very last proverb that Solomon wrote in this section, 22 verse 16, notice what he ends with, that whoever oppresses the poor comes to poverty. That was the category of individuals that were the last identified from his pen, the poor. I think that's noteworthy. And of course, my favorite proverb in this section, a joyful heart is good medicine, but a crushed spirit dries up the bones. Proverbs 17, verse 22. Thank you for your participation and engagement this evening. Appreciate it. That's the end of our class.
Good evening. Welcome to uh, Wednesday Night Bible Study. I hope your classes were as beneficial as the one I was in. Um, we've been working with uh, middle school and high school boys on uh, different public acts of worship. And so I guess they can critique me right now because they're eventually going to learn how to lead songs with Brother Sanderson. So uh, they'll, get to, they'll get to be able to do that. So I don't mind that. That's fine. Um, but before we get uh, to our first song, number 47, God is so good, just a couple of announcements. Um, please keep uh, the little girl, Sophia, in your prayers, uh, her and her family. I don't have an update. Brother uh, Woodside, do you have an update on her? No, they're still waiting to see her grandma. Okay. Okay, so just uh, continue to keep her in your prayers. That's such a tra tragic situation. And then also, uh, just remember the Christians in Ukraine and Russia. Uh, pray for... Uh, the Russian government to be brought to justice on this situation and uh, for, that, uh, for there to be peace in that area. It's such a horrific thing that, that they're all experiencing. And then uh, also you probably saw the announcement that uh, Wilma and uh, Eli are uh, proud parents, and obviously that makes Carolyn and Scott uh, proud grandparents. And so uh, we're very excited uh, for them. Other than that, there's uh, many people on, on the... Um, on the view for people that we can pray for and keep in our thoughts and prayers. So take a look at that and continue to keep them in your prayers. And also uh, continue to stay in God's word and study God's word as that will draw us closer to him. So our first song will be number 47. God is so good. <clears throat> no, God is so good. God is so good. Book number 344. We are imitation song. Last time I got up here, I uh mentioned how I'm not qualified to really advise anybody on how they should live their spiritual life. Um, I was hoping that was going to get me out of getting back up here, uh, but that didn't work. So um, I'm just going to quickly elaborate on my last talk, uh, which, had, which had two main points. Um, the first one is how it can be pretty difficult to defend your, your faith at times. Um, and I mentioned a few verses that I find pretty interesting. Um, a while back, I was listening to the Joe Rogan podcast, and he actually mentioned one of those verses, um, and I think it was his attempt to show kind of the absurdity of religion and, and Christianity. And uh, the verse was 2 Kings 2, 23 through 25, and it says, He went up there to Bethel, and while he was going up on the way, some small boys came out of the city and jeered at him, saying, Go up, you bald head. Go up, you bald head. And he turned around, and when he saw them, he cursed them in the name of the Lord. And two she-bears came out of the woods and tore 42 of the, of the boys. From there he went out to Mount Carmel, and from there he returned to Samaria. Verses like this, this is where Joe and a lot of other people 
kind of wash their hands of religion. And, uh, and I get it. If you, take, uh, if you just get a random person off the street and ask them and say, hey, hy- hypothetically, you know, once upon a time, there was this bald zookeeper. And there was a busload of unruly children that came out on a field trip and they started making fun of the zookeeper, right? What would be the more godly thing to do? Take the verbal harassment and hope it doesn't get physical? Or throw all the kids in the bear cage? And they'd be like, well, are you serious? Is that even a real question? Um, You know, what would you say if you were on the Joe Rogan show with a gazillion people listening? How would you explain that? Um, We know that this is the Old Testament, and there's a lot of wild stuff in the Old Testament, right? And we also know God moves in mysterious ways. um, And we know the Old Testament is a lot different than the New Testament. But I think that's why it's called faith. Um, And by design, a certain amount of faith is definitely necessary. Um, And I think it's super important that we listen to others' opinions and we are able to think critically about our faith. Um, You know, I do this all the time. I do this to the Mormons. After Lisa and I got married, uh, we lived in this little surf shack in Costa Mesa, and the missionaries on their 10 speeds would come around and do their rounds, and I would always be nice to them and invite them in, and can I get you something to drink, coffee, tea, you know, Red Bull? Uh, Lisa would roll her eyes and go lock herself in the back bedroom, and, uh, and she knew what was coming. And all of our discussions would end the same. Um, I would be like, so let me get this straight. An angel appeared to Joseph Smith three times, and he received a revelation commanding him to practice parole marriage. And on the third time, the angel threatened him with a sword because he didn't want to do it. So Joseph was like, sorry, guys, I don't want to. But if I don't have relations with all these women, the angel is going to come kill me. And I'm like, you guys really believe this stuff? You know the historical facts that Joseph Smith had over 40 wives. Some of them were underage, and some of them were even married to men of the congregation. How is that ordained by God? And they would never have a good answer for me, obviously. Um, And if you think about it, the only two reasons men create religions or do anything for that matter is money and women. And you can empower part of that, but I think the power is just to get the money and the women. Um, So if you see any kind of religious movement or cult, that's a massive red flag that this is not probably not a divine endeavor. Um, My second point was why I keep coming back. Um, I'm going to make this short. Um, You could say I keep coming back for the free lunch that Russ and Diane give us every Sunday. But uh, that's just a small, that's a small reason. Um, the biggest is obviously intelligent design. Um, to think this all happened by chance, it's, uh, it's pretty insane. Um, the second reason is the amount of wisdom in the Bible is undeniable. Um, the older I get, the more I'm just blown away by books like Leviticus um, and Ecclesiastes, actually. I meant to say Ecclesiastes. Leviticus is good, too, but... Um, we're not always going to have the answers, um, but there is definitely something to this. And our job is to keep searching and seeking, um, and, and find the truth. If you want to put on the armor of Christ and join him in baptism, or you just want to come forward and get the prayers of the congregation, um, come as we stand and sing. At my door is standing, patiently drawing near, entrance within demanding, whose is the voice I hear? Sweetly the tones are falling, open the door for me.
condemned to die. Sweetly the tones are falling. Open the door for me. If thou wilt heed my calling, I will abide with thee. No Once again, we'd like to thank everyone for being here this evening. Uh, please come back uh, on Sunday morning for Bible classes for all ages at 930, and then we'll have worship service. At this time, uh, we'll be led in a closing word of prayer. Let's pray. Dear gracious Heavenly Father, we thank you for this blessed day that you've given us to come here and learn more about you. Lord, we thank you for this family and community we have here that we can trust and build our faith with. Lord, we thank you so much for your word that we can use to learn more about you. Lord, help us to be good examples and shine our lights as we leave here tonight. Lord, we thank you. We thank you so much your son and his sacrifice on the cross for our sins. Lord, please give us wisdom so that we can have strength and courage to spread your gospel. Please be with those who are sick and help them to recover. Please be with Sophia at this time. Please be with those who are traveling as well and help them to get home safely. Lord, also be with those Christians in Ukraine and keep them safe. Help us to love as your son loved us. And Lord, we ask that you forgive us of all our sins. And we ask all these things in your son's name. Amen.